Well, good evening. It's like coming back home again, huh? A lot of familiar faces, some new faces. Who are new folks here? First time. Well, welcome. And you're going to have a great experience. My name is George Maniatis. I'm one of the instructors here this evening. And we have a lecture put together for you tonight to kick off the course. One of the things I want to emphasize to you this evening, unlike the World War II lecture series, which was a lecture series with a focus with some students on it, this is a course with the focus that some community members can get a, a little bit of an experience. So our really our, our focus here tonight is educating the students because they're here for this course. They paid money. That's why they have this wonderful table in front of them. We expect a lot more from them. So let's get started tonight. This wonderful collaboration, I think as we kind of listed, Russ has told you this is the collaboration between us, the community college, and the Silver Sides Museum. Here's the instructors, Kurt and myself. We don't need titles. Kurt and George is how we go by, so please. Our class schedule for this program the four lectures are going to include tonight's topic, which is drum beats of the war. We're going to start talking about the differences between north and south and leading you through kind of an odyssey of how the United States is starting to unravel in the 19, or 1830s, 40s, 50s, and of course coming to a culmination in 1860. So why do we study this wonderful war, the Civil War? Well, yes, it is the bloodiest war that Americans have participated in, with casual counts. It's a war that tore our country apart. But it is not simply a war against slavery. You've been told that, I don't know, when you were at grade school, this was a war that was fought about slavery. And we want to debunk that. Because that myth keeps surfacing from time to time, that slavery is the preeminent issue. In 1860, 1861, it is not the main issue why we're fighting. And we're going to go through a whole recitation of things that are going to be discussed that need to be examined. When we look at the Civil War, we ought to look at it through three lenses, the economic, the social, and we ought to look at it in a difference in terms of views on more than one dimension. Different insights by different regions of the country towards uh, some issues. And we need to look at that because those frame this conflict. Even if slavery wasn't there, I humbly submit there would have been a civil war. Even if slavery was not there, there would have been a civil war. Now you're going to say defend that position, and I will. When we're looking at this, we're looking at it in terms of a region, two regions that are growing at disparate rates. Their outlook towards basic economic and political issues is the difference between night and day. One can opine that the South has really not changed much different from when it was a colonial possession of England when it was supplying England with cotton. And we'll show you through the statistics that the South is so deeply wed to an agricultural economy that they are not able to transition in a period when transitions are so grave and they're changing at such a rapid pace, the South is being left in the dust. Much to the frustration of the individuals in the South who are going to try desperately to keep pace with their northern counterparts. And we'll talk about how that falls. By 1840, we have trade. Instead of traveling from north to south, that was pre previous to the early years of the country, we're going to see trade moving predominantly from east to west and west to east in both regions. The way that trade moves in each region is going to be so much different. One of the things that 
really was a game changer was the growth of railroads in the 1840s, 1850s, and of course the 1860s. To give you an idea, to ship a barrel of pork from Cincinnati, which was the hog capital of the world in the 1850s and 60s, you had to do it by boat prior to railroad. It took a grand whopping 55 days a pearl of pearl from Cincinnati, Ohio to New York City by canals. Just imagine, nearly two months. With the advent of the railroad, that same trip becomes five days. Think about the radical change in transportation. The railroad is a game changer. And because of the railroads, because of prevalent and faster shipping methods, most of the agricultural commodities throughout the 18, middle 1800s, the price of those agricultural commodities begins to slip down. Take a look at this. Per pork, which was going for $9 a barrel, $9.32 in 1818, by 1852, it's $1.18. Think about how much cheaper foodstuffs are getting. Well, what region of the country has hooked their wagon to agriculture? South. And that's going to be a problem for many people in the South. Tumbling prices are a challenge. Think is the uh, development of more farm machinery going to make the plantation style farm obsolete? The reaper, the plow, the seed drill do the job that formerly was done. Trouble is, you need money, capital. And the capital in the South has been tied up in what? Slaves. They have more money in their slaves than they do in their farm machinery and their land. Think about a farm that's mortgaged to the hilt, these plantations that are mortgaged to the hilt because they have spent their money on human property. Remember, they're treated as property. We see is the changes in infrastructure. This is a map of railroads in the 1850 and 1860. The different colors denote whether the train line was built in the 1850s or 1860s. Okay, what are you seeing here? Yeah, there is a lot more infrastructure that has built up over a 10-year period in where? Midwest, in the north. And look at how well integrated these lines are between major metropolises. Now, the south, what do you see? Not much, do you? All of these lines are designed to take the principal product, cotton, and get it out to the ports. And each one of these terminuses are ports. For example, Norfolk, Wilmington, uh, Charleston, Savannah. Why do they have to get to the port? The cotton goes from that port to where? England. Where it's going to be milled into textiles and the English will finish it off into shirts, dresses, and other things to sell to the Europeans, to do in what they call triangular trade in an earlier time, taking those same products, going to Africa, up to 1809, trading for African slaves and bringing them back, selling those slaves to people in the South. By this period of time, that slave trade has discontinued. The English are out of the slave trade. By 1809, they're no longer engaged in it. And 
There has to be a domestic component to fill the gap. The South is least able to compete economically because the North, by the 1850s and 1860s, industry is the name of the game. Cities and towns and industrial foundations are, are being built. Now these are the canals. I only show you this because prior to the railroads, this is how freight moved. Very inefficient way, isn't it? And if there isn't a river, you have to dig a canal. You know, Erie Canal. There's some other canals in Pennsylvania that had to be dug. Well, that was very expensive and less reliable than a train because the water level falls in the canal during the what? Summer and winter, it's impassable because they freeze. So this is not a great system, but the train shortened it up. Now, the other things we see, literacy, education. Yes. Go ahead. I'm sorry. We're going to get there. I see. I am pre-anticipating your question. Does the Johnny Reb know this is a bad deal, right? It's a prevailing. What do you think, Kurt? So we're still working before the war. He's going to get there. Now, 1850, literacy rates. We know in New England they prided themselves on the development of the public school. Horace Mann and folks like that. Access to literacy. Population of being able to attend basic schooling. 75% of the North is in, engaged in schooling of some sort, okay? Versus southern schooling, where the public schools are not the order of the day. Any education that's going on in the south is private tutoring or private schooling. It's on a pay-as-you-go basis. And that's going to be a big thing, because even though the, the United States in 1850 is the most literate country in the world by numbers, there's going to be a great disparity between North and South. And education will serve as a magnet for also acculturation. We begin to start to see, especially in the North, immigration and the desire to get the immigrant children into what? school because we want them to mix we want them to be part of us well this underscores it look it there's a brain drain in the south entrepreneurism industry new england is the hotbed of entrepreneurial thought of the american executives that were born in the birth year of 1825 51% of them come from new england and their father's birthplace was from the same region of the country. So there's a strong correlation. New Englanders stay in New England, they rise up and they become industrial people. Whereas the rest of the North, we start to see a growing trend of people that are entering industry and view that as a path to higher and better things. But look at the South. The number of industrial executives, 3%. Well, what are the rest of the people doing? Well, if they're wealthy, they're running a what? Plantation, farm. And by innovations, and they looked at, and this was a study, they took the main innovations from 1825 to 1860, the major innovations, and they traced where did those things come from? Well, the region of the country that has the greatest number of innovations is the North, New England and the Midwest. 
the South lags behind. And that's a problem. You don't have innovation going on. You're clinging to farming. It's a problem. Now, let us not present that the, U the North is just one wonderful paradise. Hardly is. Because at this time, there's divisions within the North. One of the divisions is, uh, of course, the Yankee Protestant reformers versus the new Catholic immigrants. Well, who are these Catholic immigrants that are flowing over? The Irish. Well, the Irish have some issues, don't they? One of them is they view life differently. Temperance is not one of their values. And I'm not picking on anybody who's Irish. I got an Irish wife. They are, uh, that just that leads them to a, a big conflict. That's not exactly something that's going to be resolved. And then we have something called the Midwest Butternuts. What are you going to say, who the heck are they? These were Southerners that had moved up to Missouri, Illinois, Indiana, tend to be typically small farmers raising pork, brewing whiskey, and corn, you know, raising corn, and they're at conflict with the rest of the Protestant wasp reformers. So there's some, and their allegiance is still sometimes with who? The South. Divided allegiance going on. The other thing we're going to see that's going to be a big change, and this is another innovation, interchangeable parts. Samuel Colt. You remember reading that in, in school, that this guy Samuel Colt de developed these guns and they had interchangeable parts where you don't need a craftsman to assemble the gun anymore because every t part is manufactured the same way. Well, the beginning of machine tooling and manufacturing processes and the primitive beginnings of assembly lines, they're in where? The north. This is going to be the envy of the world. The British are intrigued by it. They send people to the United States to find out what this guy Colt did because it was so innovative. Well, this is a northern tradition. What's going on in the south? Is there manufacturing as per se? Very, very limited, very small concerns. There's nowhere near the level going on. Now the other thing is we're seeing a change. In the north, people living in cities is on the ascendancy. These are people living in towns of 2,500 people or more. Or more, that might be Hesperia, correct? That would have been considered a town at that time, or a city. Well, you have urban dwellers, there is less reliance on what? Farming. These people make their living assembling, working in industry. They get a paycheck, a regular paycheck. They're not waiting for the fall harvest to make or break them. In the south, less 10% are living in cities. This is a rural group. And then finally, the most telling sign, the number of percentage of people in agriculture by 19, or 1860, 40% of the northerners are directly involved in ag. In the south, that number has been a constant 82, 81%. Eight out of every ten people makes their living on the farm. Now that doesn't mean necessarily the plantation. That could have been small farm, raising hogs, corn, whatever. But they're making it. Now the other thing which, which is telling. Investment in capital, man, capital investment in manufacturing. Putting money into new processes, new technologies developing new concerns. This number just hops right out at you. By 1860, the North is investing $43 per person, person in manufacturing. 
in the South, it's a paltry $13.25. Machinery, mining, processes that are going to lead to industrial development. The North has the lock, whereas the South is being left in the dust. And if you looked at that railroad map, you also noticed that there was only two connections between the north and the south, two points where the trains run north and south. You almost have two parallel spheres living different worlds. So is slavery the seminal part of this? Maybe not. So keep that in mind as we go through this course. Slavery will become larger as this fight goes on. It'll become a rallying cry, but it is not the, the, the premier thing. Well, here's the other thing I want to point to. Average days of school per year by pupil in the north. Kids, and of course, the compulsory attendance is only till the third grade in many parts of the north. That's what they call literacy. Could you imagine being literate at the third grade level? Okay. Kids went to school 135 days. That should be 80 days, not 80%, 80 days in the South. Well, 80 days is three months of schooling. And if you're only going to the third grade, what have you missed in your 80 days? We know there's a correlation between education ingenuity and innovation. The South doesn't have the brain trust to keep up. They have positioned themselves for failure because they put all their eggs in agriculture. So when we talk in the future about the slave issue, which we'll do more in depth, remember slavery is only merely the, the small part of the puzzle at the beginning. In 1860, if you were asking anybody, why are we fighting the South, it isn't about what? Slavery. But as the war begins to unfold, it becomes bigger and more poignant. All right, I'm going to turn it over at this point to Kirk, and he's going to talk some more about some of these things and more. So we want to take this walk on how did we get to war? And that's really a significant thing. How did we get to war? That's what the, the, we're going to focus on today, this idea of 1850 to 1860. A prelude to war, and how did we go from a very peaceful, growing, prosperous country, and I'll need the hostile arms. And it's a 10-year process. So understand, that's one of the things we study history. We know that this 10-year process would end in war. You do not know it at the time. And Laura, you asked a good question earlier. We're going to get to that. It's just trying to keep this stuff in chronological fashion. And that's challenging as students. Manifest destiny. The idea that we are preordained as a, as a species to set forth and conquer this continent. This was really a prevailing opinion among Americans in the 1840s. What did Manifest Destiny include but a variety of things? But we have special American virtues. We are a chosen people. It is our destiny, our duty. And all of this comes ordained by God, by our God. And when you've got such a strong pull on your culture, this is really what sets our nation in motion and very much in westward motion. The idea that we've got a duty, we have a destiny. It's our obligation. And going back, we look at this, we can see this wagon's hoe westward ideology under the very God that we worship. Our country has been expanding ever since creation in 1787, and it will continue to sp expand, of course, after this period. But at this time frame, we're pretty much up to the Mississippi River. And we're looking here in this 1850 to 1860 period. 
Yet we take just a step backwards and we've got to realize that Texas became part of this country. The Mexican state of Tejas, independence, and it would join, uh, it would declare its independence as a Lone Star state, it would join the United States after nine years of independence. And this Texas would really continue to bring about this slave free state difference. And there's so much more, like George said, than just the idea of slavery. It's the type of economies. We had two dual economies arising. And thus we would go to war over Texas, and most of us have learned this in school, the idea of where was the rightful Texas border. And rightful, of course, is always suspect, depending upon your position. We would call this President Polk's War. Probably not a necessary war at all, and one of the leading critics of this war was a pretty irrelevant um, man from Illinois called Abraham Lincoln. And he was not anyone of any particular note at this time, just another attorney. He had served earlier in what was called the Black Hawk War, but he was a critic of this. But this would be really a, a manifestation of our destiny. The war itself would actually be in many ways one of our first world wars, as indeed we're fighting out of two coastlines, attacking Mexico from many different ways and traveling thousands of miles, something we had not done previously. And was this a defensive war or was this a war of aggression? And certainly there was a lot of dispute on that. What is important about this war for our uh, Civil War is that this became a training ground. At this time, of course, only having one military, all of these young officers, all of these lieutenants and captains, they knew each other. They all served together. Lieutenant Ulysses S. Grant served under Captain Robert E. Lee. Ulysses S. Grant, a northern uh, way to be general, of course, in the war, his best friend was Lieutenant Longstreet. And they would be on opposite sides of the Civil War. They were best men in each other's wedding. So these gentlemen knew each other. And they effectively engaged in combat together. They were brothers, later torn apart. The Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo, that would present us with the territory we know today as Texas, Arizona, New Mexico, California, and what's relevant here is most all of this is south of a 3630 line, which would ultimately end up being, is this territory open for slavery or is it not? And that was really the issue here. What was the position on slavery? The Wilmot provi proviso would be passed. The idea that any new territory obtained from Mexico which would be these territories, would not be open for slavery. Well, there's some tremendous question whether a mere senator had the ability to, to pass such a thing. Where in the Constitution did it say there shall be no expansion of, of slavery? So this was very much an issue of the right to slave long before the war arose. It was a threat to Southern interests. California would join the Union, and we know very much in part the story of California, but looking at California from a physical point of view, a long coastline state that could have come in as several states, that could have come in as either a northern or a southern state, that could have been eligible for slavery or not, and indeed ultimately it was not, but it would upset this balance. One of the ways we maintain a fragile peace in our country was the idea that we admitted states two at a time, keeping a balance of slave and free states. And that really dates back to something called, we call the Missouri Compromise of 1820, and we'll take a look at a Missouri Compromise of 1850. The idea that how do we settle this issue of uneven number of states? And it was a compromise allowing California to come in as a free state. And what's going to go further? Well, this idea of popular sovereignty. 
Should we let the states decide? Should we let the people, the inhabitants of the states? So in many respects, I agree with George. This was not a war looming over slavery, but it was very much a war looming over the right of states to enslave. We look at the United States in 1850. Just from a physical point of view, clearly there are far larger amount of territory under slavery than there is under free states. And later when we get to the nuts and bolts of the war, we'll learn that Lincoln's plan was so essential for what they called the border states of Missouri, Kentucky, Virginia, Delaware, and Maryland. Those were five states that were slaving states that ultimately would never secede. And take a good look at Virginia there, because West Virginia would not be created until 1861 during the war over 34 colonies, or excuse me, 34 counties that would not reject the, uh, you know, the idea of slavery. So we, there's going to be a lot of, uh, as we say, politics. Lewis Cass of Michigan, over in the Thumb area, there's a Cass City, named after Lewis Cass, one of our first uh, political giants, put forth the idea of popular sovereignty, allow democracy to flourish, allow the states to decide on whether there should be slavery or not. And that's a very attractive ideology. And we'd see that later continuing on in 1858 with the infamous Lincoln-Douglas debates. The Nebraska Act, the Kansas-Nebraska Act was another compromise. And as students, you've got to understand Compromise is the very key to our government, past, current, and present. Compromise is never a weakness. It's almost always a strategy for success. And the idea here is should popular sovereignty, should we take a vote? Well, a vote always sounds good. But then again, should we be voting on someone's rights? And that's the question. Morgan in front here has got a Mackinac Island shirt. So if we held a vote in this room among students, all people with a Mackinac Island shirt gets an F. All people without a Mackinac Island shirt gets an A. How are we going to vote on that? It's going to pass overwhelmingly, so that's democracy in action. We've got to be questionable when you're voting on someone's rights. How many slaves were going to vote in this popular sovereignty plan? Absolutely none. And Kansas would be a very bloody civil war. And it would be called Bleeding Kansas. And a very zealot patriot or terrorist, depending upon your view, John Brown would lead an impromptu army in, the seek, in helping potential slaves. So there's, our history is just filled with conflict over this issue. The rise of Republicans, today's Republican Party was created in 1854, and their first meeting was actually in Jackson, Michigan. 1856, they put forth their first candidate, and the Republican Party would grow out of an abolitionist movement, an anti-slavery. That would be the very roots of the Republican Party. 1858, at this time, our senators were elected by the state legislators. Now, it was common to travel the state giving uh, you know, debates and seeking public support, but at the end of the day, it was not going to be a direct election. And thus, we've got Stephen Douglas and Abraham Lincoln. And Douglas is the reigning senator. He is the big man who's about five foot two, and he is the incumbent. And Abraham Lincoln, important, becoming well known, but certainly no one on the national scene was at all plugged into an Abraham Lincoln. And thus, a series of Lincoln-Douglas debates throughout the state, and Abraham Lincoln, the idea that we cannot survive half slave and half free which is a very noble statement, and we remember him for that, that's a long way from emancipation. 
That word emancipation never once came out of his mouth during the 1858 campaign. So as George said, the idea of slavery is going to evolve through the war, certainly not before the war. So on election day, we can see that it is, remember, we have a popular vote, and this was common in all states actually, yet the popular vote is really more cursatory. It is going to be the senators and the representatives from the state house and we can see it's overwhelmingly Democrats, and thus Lincoln would not be successful. He would not be named senator in 1858, which is very interesting because had he won this Senate race, we might have had an entirely different history. An entirely different history. Had he won the Senate race, what's the probability of him running for president two years later? Hard to tell, but not very likely. In Michigan in November, we're going to elect a new senator to fill Carl Levin's seat. Whomever that senator is, not likely they're going to be running for president in two years. So history could have been slightly different. A house divided, half slave and half free. And kind of watch this metamorphosis on the map, please. Our country is changing. It's changing slowly. Slavery is at the heart of this, but it's far more than just enslavement. It's really the whole idea of do we have the legal right to enslave? And this would tear our nation up. And it's interesting, as we'll find throughout this course, how many people fought for the right of slavery yeah, we'll learn that there were very, very few slaveholders when you looked at a numerical number of slaveholders. There just were not that many. We're a nation in turmoil, and states' rights is very much what's at the forefront of our nation. In so many respects, while our country was created in 1787, the new constitution, you might be very accurate in saying we were states united. I mean, it wouldn't be till after the Civil War would we become the United States. And there are two different issues here. And as we've learned with several anecdotal things that you probably know about the Civil War, many people still felt far more tied to their state than to the country. Abraham Lincoln approached Robert E. Lee to lead the Union troops. And he said, I cannot go against my state of Virginia. So at this time, this is a state's rights is very much on the forefront of our minds. But the idea of where is that authority in our lives? Where is that authority in government? And we look far more to our state capitals than we did to Washington, D.C. at the time. So we look at the American Civil War, 1861 to 1865 truly a history of very uncivil behavior. And by civil war, we, we use that term when we look at an internal war. But I guess we could argue all wars are pretty uh, uncivil. One of the problems with this war is that everybody felt it was coming. Pretty much by 1857, war became inevitable. And when you talk that way, when you feel that way, it tends to be a self-fulfilling prophecy. And that was really one of the challenges. You know, war has never happened until it does. Nothing is inevitable. But the, again, the, the talk everywhere was this has to happen. And when you talk that way, you're probably not looking for solutions. This is a brother versus brother war. There are many names for this war. The War of Rebellion is the official name. The Civil War is more of a slang name. When you look up the official records of the War of Rebellion, that's the official war. It's state versus state, brother versus brother. I don't know how important the exact name is, 
but civil war is more of a slang term. When we try to address the causes of the civil war, there were many. There were many causes. There is no one cause. And again, George was so spot on with the idea of trying to get our eye off of slavery. It's not that slavery is not important. I'm not a revisionist who's trying to minimize it. There were several reasons, many reasons, for the cause of this war. We're going to spend some time with this. Your reading will outline that, as will the guides, as will other things that you've learned. But we look at property rights. Property versus individuals. And the idea of government telling us what we can do with property, and while it's very sad in today's context, slaves were viewed as property. And thus being told what you can do. We still are a very, very strong property right nation today. We truly are. Looking at the idea of westward expansion, who will control the West? We know that the future is in the West. One of the challenges the South had is because of their agrarian economy, because of their tremendous dependence upon cotton, they needed far more land. Cotton is very exhaustive to the land. It takes out far, far more than it puts in. You need a heavy rotation of fallow fields to grow cotton successfully. And thus, you really needed new lands. If, if cotton lands did not expand, they would exhaust themselves. Another southern crop, tobacco, also very, very intensively extractive from the land. As were northern crops, when you look at corn and particularly wheat, much less taking from the land. So this idea of westward expansion, who's going to control that? Will that be controlled by the north or south? Who is, what is going to be the future of that regarding property rights? That was very essential. Yes, the very system of slavery. Slavery has been a system, well, it's been involved worldwide for thousands of years. In this country, it, had, it was about the 250-year mark. We started slavery in the early 1600s. Yet it continually has changed and evolved and likely was going to here as well. And a lot had to do with Eli Whitney and the cotton gin. But the future of slavery without this war, without any regulation, was going to change. Machines were far more efficient and were going to change the very nature of slavery. And again, a grotesque industry by all standards in 2014. We have to understand that slaves, which at this time were being purchased anywhere seven, eight, nine hundred dollars each. And thus, if you're purchasing 10, 12, 15, 25, 30 slaves, you bought those on a mortgage. You went to your baker and got out a $30,000 loan. And the idea of, a, of any type of emancipation, which would come far later, well, you still owe your banker money. Imagine today if magically all the cars just disappeared. Boom, they disappeared. Wonderful. What would your banker say? Pay me. You still owe the banker. You still owe the finance company. You still owe. So slaves were a huge investment by the South. And again, getting past the gross inhumanity of slavery, it was an economic system that could not would not be disabled easily. Multiple, multiple causes. One of the things we do well in history is we tend to encapsulize things into three bullet points, present it to students, and then give you some type of test with a bubble Scantron thing to circle the right A, B, C, or D, and it's called knowledge. One of the things we do terribly is we try to reduce a complex topic into simplicity. This is a very complex topic. What would it take today? What would it take today for our nation to go to war against itself? In many ways, we're drawn very much by the same lines. We just call them Democrats and Republicans. We know the last handful of elections have been very close. What would it take for us to actually go to war over that? It would not be one issue in 2014, I assure you. It was not one issue 
in 1861. So please do not sim simplify things that are very convoluted. Besides, if things are too simple, you put us history professors out of work. We, we only exist when we... Exactly. We have what we call proximate causes of the war. What were these straws that final, finally broke the camel's back? And there's several of them, but truly the 1850 compromise is one, the Dred Scott decision is the second one, and the election of Abraham Lincoln, that would be the final proximate cause. There's nothing more fun than seeing students scribbling these notes down like they should be doing, and then you go backwards instead of frontwards just to trick them up a little bit. It works all the time. We'll go through each one of these. Remember this from about 20 minutes ago? The Missouri Compromise, the thing with the Missouri Compromise is that in order to allow California into the nation, we had to make a series of concessions. And one of the many ones was something called the Fugitive Slave Law. And this gave rise and really strength to a previous law, the idea that slaves are property. And when property is missing, you have the right to recover it. If I lose my book, it's over at George's house. Well, of course I have the right to go over and get that book. It's got my name on it. That's my book. Well. The same thing with slaves. When they would escape through the Underground Railroad to the north, this would give the fugitive slave catchers the right to go and recover them. This was one of the compromises of this Missouri Compromise because, again, we were set such a balance for so many years. Kind of like the Ark. States were coming aboard two by two. And now... California is upsetting that. And yes, the Southerners knew that was not in their interest, but they knew it was in their greater interest that California was a boom for the country. Interesting how California became a state in 1850. What was found in 1849? Amazing. Yes. The, the Dred Scott case. This is an interesting court case, and we look at the landmark court cases of our Constitution. Prior to this time, of course, slavery is just what it is, slavery. Well, Dred Scott is a slave who is owned by Peter Blow, who's living in Illinois. They take him to Missouri. They set up residence. This is called a test case, Missouri, a slave state. Then they take Dred Scott back to Illinois a state without slavery. Then Dred Scott is taken by his owner up to Wisconsin, a state that is prohibited to ever have slavery. And then he is brought back to Missouri to legally challenge this. And you really have to admire the idea of Dred Scott doing this. His owner, Peter Blow, was willing to give him freedom any place. If he was just concerned about himself, he just said, Illinois, great, I'm out of here. Wisconsin, wonderful, give me some cheese and I'm gone. But no, he came back to Missouri to file a suit. And this would go before the Supreme Court. And the court would actually use a book. And they would say, this book here in Missouri is a book. And then when you run this book over to Illinois, what is this? It's a book. And then we move it over to Wisconsin, this is still a, once a book, it's always a book. And they use the same ruling. Once a slave, always a slave. That was the ruling in 1857. And the Southerners were, of course, well, yeah, what the hell? So we told you that. That's, it reaffirmed Southern ideology of slavery. Once a slave, always a slave. And it comes from the highest court in the land. Roger Taney, when you look at the Chief Justice's words and you read these words, it makes it pretty clear how, what side the court comes down on this. Now, we had seven Southerners on the court, two Northerners. Five of the seven Southerners were slaveholders. 
So perhaps, just like our court in modern times, perhaps it's no surprise because politics in our court has never been far apart. But these are horrific words to write in an opinion. And when you're looking at an opinion for judicial clarity, well, like it or not, these words are pretty darn clear. Again, the Missouri Compromise, the Dred Scott decision, war is essentially inevitable. We can't stop it. This would be the final straw, so to speak, would be the election of Abraham Lincoln. Now, it's interesting. Lincoln would campaign, and he would campaign on no expansion of slavery. Not one moment did he ever campaign to the idea that he's going to abolish slavery. A nationwide campaign, Lincoln was the Republican candidate. Do we know who the Democrat candidate was? Stephen Douglas. Amazing, the very two gentlemen that faced off in the Senate race in 1858 would face off in a nationwide race for the president. Douglas won this. Clearly the vote was very close. He lost the popular vote, but Douglas was the senator. And he was the reasonable man, popular sovereignty. He was the compromise candidate everyone could live with. But ultimately, that would set up this election of 1880. And you can see there were a few other candidates splitting the vote. And Lincoln would win. You can see he won quite a few of the uh, electoral votes, a comfortable but not overwhelming popular vote. But he was only elected by 40% of the public. Lincoln was a minority president. This was no overwhelming mandate for the tall man from Illinois with very weak credentials. Between the time that Lincoln was elected in November and the time that he would take office would be March. Today we install our new presidents in January, January 20th. This time we waited five months where we go through the winter. So he's elected in November. He will not take office until March, and our country will change dramatically. We look at reasons for war. We would go to war on this. What are the reasons? The Union, the North is to preserve the Union. There's no mention of slavery up there, to preserve the Union. And the South, they want independence. Exactly the same thing that the country wanted a mere 85 years ago. So the point is that the South was only looking for exactly what the United States sought from Britain 85, actually 87 years ago. As we know, four score and seven years ago. So understand that these are the reasons for fighting. This is the reasons for the war. George alluded to the economic uh, dif differences between the North and the South. This shows along the same ideas. Look at population. And what was interesting in the South, we didn't know how many slaves there were. There was not a good census. Because when the census people came, that was to count heads for taxation. And thus it was very hard. Most, of the, most educated people thought there was less than a million slaves in the South. And upon completion of the war, there was actually some plans that Lincoln had rolled out as far as shipping slaves back to Africa. Didn't under, we just had no concept that there was three and a half million. That would not come clear until afterwards with something called the Freedmen's Bureau. But you can see a tremendous population equity. George mentioned manufacturing plants. He showed you that data of how much money was put into invested in the manufacturing. Well, look at manufacturing plants. What's going to be needed to be manufactured? Well, cannons, guns, small weapons, artillery. So the huge difference, look at the difference in arms production. 
Traeger Ironworks was really the only arms production in Richmond of any significant note on the eve of the war. So the North had all of these advantages. Here's another railroad chart. Looks like someone's coming to Muskegon. We see Richmond, and then over at Chattanooga, the only two points that bisect. The only two points. We've got, as George indicated, a very separate development of these nations. And that really goes back right to their start. It truly does. Just as Britain treated the colonies as a lesser than nation, the North treated the South the same way. What were some strategies? What was the strength of the South? Southern comfort, I like to call it. They had a military tradition. Two-thirds of all of your West Point graduates were from the South. A long coastline. The North is going to put a blockade, and that would be successful, not in the beginning. It would take a while. There's an extremely long coastline. The South would be seeking French aid. Remember, it was the French, and make no mistakes, it was the French that allowed us to earn our independence uh, in the Revolutionary War. No French, we're drinking tea, not coffee. The soldiers were fighting for home and culture and asking what were people, when you fight for home and culture, whether that's right or wrong, whether you agree with the culture or not, whether slavery is good or bad, when you're fighting for home and culture, those are very, very strong intangibles. And this is, was really what the South, what their strength was, so to speak. A strategic plan. The South did not have to win. They knew that. Students, you saw that in your reading, the question regarding Longstreet and being defensive. Longstreet was a defensive general the entire war, not just at Gettysburg, because they realized fighting not to lose is different than fighting to win. The South did not have to win. They had to not lose. That was essential. The North would feature their anaconda strategy. They would effectively blockade the coastline. They would thrust down the Mississippi, cut the Confederacy in half, and strangle the rebellion. And this is really Winfred Scott, the hero of the War of 1812. So Winfred Scott is about 192 years old this time. He's actually in his upper 70s, and uh, this was his strategy, and it was the right strategy. It truly was. Like every strategy, it would not come easy, it would not come quickly. So the idea of surrounding the South, and for those uh, many of us who have seen some of the Civil War movies, we see the infamous blockade runners. Surrounding the South, cutting off their import and exports. Because more than anything, the South needed to export their cotton to import weapons. Cotton was, at the time, the South controlled approximately 75% of the global cotton market. You could we'll take a look at King Cotton, and you can very much compare that to OPEC oil today. They had the strang same stranglehold on the market. Now, it's always easier to be professors critiquing this 150 years later. What the South did in 1860 is on the eve of war, as war became imminent but not yet engaged, they held back all their cotton from the global market. They withheld that cotton, thinking that they would create a shortage, and they did. Over a million textile workers were laid off in Britain. A million textile workers laid off in Britain that put tremendous pressure on the British government which would put it on the northern government to settle this war before it even started. Yet, in retrospect, if you look at it, that was their currency. They very much should have sold all their cotton and had enough money to purchase all the weapons that they needed. Again, always easy to critique after the fact. Step two of this strategy, 
blockade the coastline, thrust down the Mississippi. Easy? Well, it would take uh, General Grant over 15 months to make it down past Vicksburg. And we'll learn of seven different attempts. Nothing was easy. The blockade was not easy. This would take time. General Scott predicted this would take years. He ultimately would live about a year and a half through the war and pass away. And like any war, no commander-in-chief ever wants to hear anything but quickly. But this strategy would take quite a bit of time. You have to understand that when the South seceded, they started immediately after Lincoln's election in November. But Lincoln's not president until March. And it came in waves. We look at the blue states, the lower south. They were the first ones to secede. The very first capital was set up in Montgomery, Alabama. That was the capital of the Confederacy. The gray states, those the upper south, those would be the second ones to secede. And they would come a bit later on this. Now remember, Virginia is the most essential state at this time. Five of our first presidents were from Virginia. And really, right up to this point, particularly in the South, Virginia was absolutely critical to any success they would have. And so once that the Upper South would secede, and that would not be till after Lincoln took office. And we'll talk about Fort Sumner next week. We'll get into those first shots, the first cuts. When Virginia would secede, that's when the Confederacy is so acquiescent, they were so glad to have Virginia, they moved the capital of the Confederacy to Richmond, a mere hundred miles away from Washington, D.C. President Lincoln had to come into Washington, D.C. under heavy guard. He had to come in on a train, and there were a couple of, uh, quote, fake trains. And he needed security. No one had ever needed security before. It was preposterous. He needed security, because there was a very chance that he would be assassinated and thus the Pinkerton Detective Agency would provide security for him. And that Pinkerton Detective Agency would morph into the Secret Service that we know today. So instead of coming in with fanfare and celebration as a new president, he effectively snuck in from the, uh, through Maryland, which was a border state, a slaveholding state, in the middle of the night to take office. Lincoln's essential strategy was, look at those border states, Missouri, Kentucky, Maryland, those states, Delaware, those were slaveholding states, but he cannot lose those. Maryland was utmost importance, because if you look at where Washington, D.C. is located at, it is located in between Maryland and Virginia. You're not much of a president in a few square miles if you're into slave country, rebellion company on bo country on both sides of you. So Lincoln faced just astronomical challenges as he took office. But do know that the movement to secession was not automatic. It was not done at all without lots of consultation, and it was done in stages. It truly was. So thus the battle lines are drawn. And we've never fought a battlefield this size. The Revolutionary War was relatively small. Our War of 1812 covered a tremendous area, but we've never had to fight a battle, and this would be such a leap forward into something we call total war. And when you look at war theories and the idea of total war, it would begin with the Civil War and kind of manifest itself out over the next 80 years with World War II. So why do people fight? There are many reasons why people fight. There is no one reason why people fight. Often they're abstractions. But what do they really fight for? More than anything, your social groups, your family. When your way of life is feeling threatened, whether it was or not is almost irrelevant. When you perceive that your very way of life is feeling threatened, that's generally one of the big signs. The idea of self-respect, self-protection, self-promotion. We fight for very, I mean, it's a very personal thing. It truly is. 
And when you look at wars in your lifetime and what garners support and what doesn't, I think you'll see some of the things up here. Resources and access to resources. These are reasons why people fight. And really, because we all have a vestment. Every person on this planet has a vestment in the very way that they live. And thus, seemingly, when they, whoever they are, attack our way of life, you'll hear that in almost any struggle anywhere on the planet. And that's almost always a rallying cry. So as we proceed on with this war, understanding why people fight and understand that wars are always changing. Look at every one of our wars. The reason for fighting at the end is virtually never the reasons at the beginning. So this would be a war between the states, a war of rebellion, a war really for the very soul of our nation. That's the, the stakes here. That's what this war is about. And I think that's the most important reason why we study this. I think more than anything else, to understand what it is in American history that we are, we need to study this war. There's much to learn about the uh, World War I or World War II or Vietnam, and they all had their place. But this war was really, I believe, the seminal moment in our country's history and the defining ideology of who we are or who we are not. So the question we always ask in class, you know, students, why do we study history? And students always give us the answer, so we don't repeat it. How's that working for us, Nick? It doesn't work, that, that's like the, that's the last, when you're on a game show, and trust me, the stuff we teach you is very valuable for game shows. When you're on a game show, that's the last answer. Because I think all of us can assess history and say, yep, we've repeated problems many times. We do it on our own things, we really do. We study history because when you know who you were, then you know who you are and who you will be. Understanding who we are today, we have to figure out who we were as a country. And to know who we are today is how we project who will be tomorrow.